Welcome to the Library of Congress. Who's been here before? Oh, nice. Welcome back. And who's here for the first time? Welcome. Oh. Welcome. Okay. Making sure we're on. So my name is Sasha. I work here in the Young Reader Center. And I am so happy to welcome you guys and our special guest today for our super awesome program. So before we start, I just want to tell you that um, this program is a really beautiful friendship between Barb Rosenstock and the Library of Congress because she likes to write stories about history that interweaves the stories of people and times when they lived. So who likes to learn about baseball? She wrote a book about baseball and the library does a really big exhibit about baseball you can check out and you can come back when you don't have school. Yeah, there it is, about Giorgio Maggio. And who likes music? Yeah, so Barb Rosenstock wrote a book about bluegrass. It's a type of music. And we have really huge collections where you can listen and not just look at records of the music that we have. And I could keep going forever, but you really want to get going to our special <laughs> guest today because today she'll talk about oceans and discoveries and some really amazing stories. And guess what? That story is also at the Library of Congress, and we're going to learn how those two things come together. And also the journey of Barb's research and writing and you know, getting together with you guys and sharing the story. So how about we welcome Barb Rosenstock. Thank you guys, thank you Sasha. And thank all of you guys for being here today at the Library of Congress. I'm Barb Rosenstock, and I'm the author of all these books that you see here and some other ones besides that weren't here. But today, we're going to talk about just one book, and it's called Otis and Will Discover the Deep. And I'm going to kind of tell you the story behind the story. Because if you didn't know this, every single book that you have ever read, there's a story behind the story of the book. So we're going to talk about that today. But first, I'm going to start by having you guys play a little game. All right? Okay. So here's the game. I've got a bag full of things that you might have read. Okay? In the last 30 days, so like since Halloween, if I pull something out of my bag and you've read something like that, I want you to put your hands up and wave them like this, okay? If you haven't read what I pull out of my bag, I want you to go like this, all right? All right, are you ready? Okay, um, let's start with how many people have read a book with a cover, with a hard cover. Put your hands up if you read a book with a hard cover. Okay. How many people have read a paperback chapter book or a graphic novel? Ooh, quite a bit. Okay, you guys are better, are really good readers. Now, how many of you have read a magazine? All right, readers. What about something on a screen? Right? Okay. What about food packaging, like a cereal box or the back of a cookie like this is cookies what about instructions to something this is instructions to a video game you've read instructions too oh my gosh you guys have read everything what about a menu oh my gosh you guys are great readers all right what about an ancient scroll what okay all right third graders all right Third graders, those of you who are raising your hands that you read an ancient scroll, after the program's over, I want to talk to you, okay? Because I want to know what kind of ancient scroll you read in third grade, all right? So <laughs> later on, you're going to tell me all about that. So you guys are all readers and big readers, right? Just like an author is. Now, that was the game we played. What have you read lately? We are here at the Library of Congress. All of the things that I showed you and a million other things be besides are saved here at the Library of Congress. You guys are at the biggest library on the planet Earth. All right? They have books and magazines and newspapers and letters and postcards and movies and credits and comics. Yes, and posters and advertising and 
everything that you could think of, graphic novels, everything you could think of. All right, now the Library of Congress is, here's three cool facts. I once read a book, wrote a book, read a book, I read a book about the Library of Congress too, but I wrote a book about the Library of Congress called Thomas Jefferson Builds a Library. And here's the three, three cool facts about the Library of Congress. The first one is, number three, 160 million items, 39 million books, 3.6 million music recordings, 14.8 million photos, and there's 850 miles of shelves. You guys, I'm from Chicago. You're in Washington, D.C. 850 miles of shelves means that we could start in Washington, D.C. and read book by book on those shelves, and when we get to Chicago, we'd still have books left over. That's 850 miles of shelves. All right, number two, the books aren't just in English, they're in 470 different languages. So I didn't even know there were 470 different languages before I wrote that book. Right, and this is the coolest thing, it belongs to all of us. If you're here, you can look at the books in the Library of Congress or any of their materials. And once you're 16, you can even look into some of the research collections here. So the Library of Congress is super cool. It's the wordiest place on earth. <laughs> All right? That's the main reading, reading room. If you guys have not had a chance to see it, I, I hope that you'll be able to stop by, if not today, sometime soon. All right, now, since we're all readers and we're in the wordiest place on earth, what do we do with words we don't know? Did you guys ever read something and come across a word that you don't know when you're reading? How many of you have? Raise your hand if you come across. All right, now, pretend we don't have a dictionary. What can, how can you figure out a word? that If you come across a word while you're reading and you don't know it, how can you figure, like, how do we figure those out? Yeah, huh? Sound Sound it out or pronounce it, and sometimes that will give you clues. What about one more? Use the context. Use the context. Excuse me, third graders. <laughs> context clues. Your teacher's doing a good job, aren't you? Um, yeah, you can do context. Well, I, this book, Otis and Will Discover the, Be the Deep, started with one word, and it was a word that I read. I can't remember where I read it. I think it was some magazine article. Here's the word, bathysphere. And I, got, I came across that word and I went, what? What's, what's a bathysphere? It, is it a bath toy? Is it a round bathtub? Well, who would take a bath in a round bathtub? That didn't seem right. And I couldn't tell from the other words around it really what it meant. So I had to look it up. And I learned that a bathysphere was one of our first, earliest crafts to learn about the deep ocean. This is a bathysphere. It was a big, or actually kind of a small, we'll, show, we'll tell you, show you that later, steel ball. And these two explorers, Will Beebe and Otis Barton, went down in that bathysphere into that steel ball down down into the deep and they were early ocean explorers honey you know what we're going to save our questions till the very end so please please though remember it because i really want to take your question later okay all right so it's a true story now why i do i like true stories so much you guys that is chubby three-year-old me with my chubby grandpa stan Okay, and he was always telling me stories. My grandpa told true stories, mostly about people that he'd met when he was um, first here in this country, that he met when he was in his different businesses, funny things about the grocery store guy, about my mom's friends. He told me all kinds of funny stories about people. How many of you guys have someone in your family or a neighbor or something that tells funny stories about the past or tells good, good stories? Yeah. If you have someone like that in your life, if you're going to write a story of your own, remember those people's stories. Because your family stories can be really good starting off points for your own writing. So I always cared about true stories. But why do I care about this true story? Well, it's because of a cartoon. 
when I was about in third grade. Every time, every day I got home from school and every day I switched on a cartoon. So I switched on the TV and watched a cartoon. And this was one of my favorite cartoons that I'm gonna show you. You guys should not laugh at it. Well, you're gonna laugh at it because it's 2018 and this cartoon is in black and white. And just wait till you see the special effects with the fish. Okay, are you ready to see the cartoon I watched every day after school? Okay, here we go. That was Diver Dan. Doesn't it look just like a Pixar movie now? <laughs> but I love Diver Dan. If you notice, one of the fish even has like a little cigarette in his mouth. That's how old ago. That's how old it was. All right. So, but I love Diver Dan. So as soon as I saw that picture of the bathysphere, it reminded me of this adventure story, like this cartoony kind of adventure story that I really wanted to tell. Now, telling true stories. Um, requires research. Can anyone tell me what, it, research is kind of a fancy name. So anyone tell me what is research? What's research? What's research, hon? Studying something. Studying something. It means learning about something, right? So if you learn about it in the library, that's one kind of research. If you learn about it by asking people, that's another kind of research, right? Doesn't really matter as long as you're learning about it and you're learning the truth about it. It's research, right? Okay, now, Research is kind of like there's surface questions and then there's deeper questions, just like the ocean. Okay, now, if you were gonna learn about the bathysphere, what do you guys think is like one of the surface questions? Sometimes those are the easier questions to answer. What do you guys think would be one of the surface questions about the bathysphere? Yeah. What color, what color was it, right? Because you could get that just by looking at a picture of it maybe. Yes, honey. When was it made? That's another surface question. Anybody got one more? The shape. the shape of it, right? It was a sphere. It wasn't a bath toy. It was a round ocean going craft. Now, what about a deeper question? What would be like a deeper question that might not be as easy to find the answer? Yes. How was it made? Like all the science and the engineering behind it. Yeah, what else? What year did they go in? Maybe the whole more, the whole timeline of it? Yeah, huh? What's inside, What's inside of it? Those are really good ones. Now, we're going to take, you guys, you're going to have a lot of time for questions later. The surface questions usually in, when you research something are things we can find on the internet and sometimes and in books. Okay, that's where we can find a lot of our surface questions answered. But when we want deep questions answered, we usually have to go back in time. Sometimes that's through books, but a lot of times it's through old magazines, people's diaries, letters, things from the actual time that we're trying to write about. So I went back to the Library of Congress because I thought I was looking on the web. Library of Congress has this wonderful website, and it said that they, had, they might have some information about the bathysphere. And I got to tell you, I might have been just a tiny bit lazy that day. Because instead of searching through them all, which I could have done, I went to something on the Library of Congress website called Ask a Librarian. And I clicked on Ask a Librarian, and you can just type in whatever question you want. And the librarians answer usually. All right? So I went to Ask a Librarian, and I said, it looks like you guys might have some things about the bathysphere, but what do you really have at the Library of Congress? And then I waited. And I only had to wait one day. And I got an email back from some lady named Constance Carter. And she sounded like a perfectly good librarian lady, right? I didn't know who she was. I thought, OK, Constance Carter, LOC, I'll open up the email. So I click on it, I open the email, and here's where things get super cool and weird. Because when you're a writer and you're working on a book and it's really coming together, it's almost like the universe comes together and makes the book, helps you write the book, right? 
Constance Carter starts her email saying, yes, I know something about the bathysphere because I knew William Beebe and worked with him. When I got out of college, I worked in his laboratory. So she knew my main character. So I had a direct connection to history right there. And Con Constance Carter, Connie Carter, became like my link to this book. The person who sent me videos, sent me some pictures, also told me that William Beebe's, all of his diaries and a lot of the bathysphere material was housed at a place called the Wildlife Conservation Society. If any of you have been to New York, it's at the Bronx Zoo in New York. And I went there to the Wildlife Conservation Society, and they had all the pictures of the bathysphere dives and all kinds of materials there. Now, just so you guys know, a lot of times third graders think that because I'm an author and I go to the Wildlife Conservation Society, that, that uh, that's like something special. But I want to tell you guys, now that there is the internet, any place like that, the Conservation Society, if you, some of you said you were interested in baseball, if you write the Baseball Hall of Fame and you have a question, the Football Hall of Fame, the Basketball Hall of Fame, it doesn't matter. If you write about dancing, if you write about, um, let's see, oceans, what else? What else are you guys interested in? Someone tell me something you're interested in. What? In the History Nation, okay, there's history museums. You guys as third graders can use the internet and write those history museums and get answers to questions. There are grown up experts in those places that will help you out. All right, you wanna share what you like? Yeah. Okay, this is the last one we're gonna take, but go ahead, share. I like the sport cricket. You like the sport cricket, which by the way, needs a good picture book. So if I don't write it, you should later, okay? <laughs> okay, all right. So you can use these experts too. Now, after all that research, does anyone know what this is? Look at it, it's small. What does it look like? Can you guess what it is? What is it? It's a bathysphere. It's, well, that's my bad drawing. Are you glad I didn't do the illustrations? Because that's my drawing of the bathysphere. What is this? This, a blueprint is a really great way to put it. It's the book idea. This is a book idea. Does this look like my book? No. No, right? I just started sketching out, all right, now I know some things. I want it to be about a bathysphere. I want them to go down 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet. I think something's gonna happen. I really wasn't sure what I wanted to write, but I did know that stories need problems. Okay, so I really had to think hard about what Otis Barton and Will Beebe's challenges or problems were in the bathysphere. And the first one was light. If you think about it, you start at the top of the ocean and you go to the bottom, what's gonna happen? It gets darker, right? It gets darker. Now, I need two friends to help me come up here and show everybody uh, the ocean, all right? Um, you and you, come on up. We're gonna do it right over here. What's your name, hon? Zuri. Zuri? Yeah. Okay, and what's your name, Ed? <coughs> Caleb. Caleb, okay, Zuri and Caleb are gonna help us. They are gonna show us the ocean. Caleb, you guys, both of you wanna come over here. You're gonna be like authors, yeah. Well, no, Zuri, probably you on one side, Caleb on the other. All right, because you're gonna face these people. This is your audience, all right? Okay, Caleb, you are first going to take the cover off of this and pour this entire bottle into this jar carefully. Okay, you might want to use two hands. Suri, you are going to just keep pouring. It's going to take a while. You are going to turn this water the color of an ocean. Okay, if you've never used food coloring before, it can get on your hands, so be really careful, all right? You want to use maybe one drop of blue and maybe one drop of green if you want, but if you like it the way it looks with just blue, you don't have to put the green in, okay? And then stir it up. All right, keep going. Glug, glug. It helps if you tilt it just a little bit just to get the rest out. There you go. Okay, all right, perfect. Okay, now stir that all up. I think that's about right. That's close enough, Caleb. Let's take that out. All right. Okay, Zuri, I want you to pour that in there. Oh. 
the whole thing. Okay, now Caleb, I want you to measure a half a cup. Can you measure a half a cup? It's right there, you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, pour a half a cup of that oil in that cup. That's good. Okay, now pour the oil in our jar. Oops, wrong color. Whoa. All right, thank you. Zuri, Caleb, take a little bow. <laughs> and you guys can go back and sit down. Okay, Zuri and Caleb have just made the ocean. All right, if you can see it, it's a little bubbly. We'll stop being bubbly in a second. You see how it's this much of the, if this was the whole ocean, this is how much of the ocean is dark, dark, dark without light. Okay, it's called the aphotic part. It's where some very strange creatures, some of which light up themselves, live. This part in the middle, you see the part that's blue-green? Okay, the part that's blue-green is called the dysphotic. And that's where jellyfish, some whales, things that are a little bit bigger than what we're used to, live. At the very top, you see the gold part? This is basically the only part of the ocean most human beings see, even if they dive. We only go in this part. And that's where all the fish that we're used to seeing, like clownfish and um, you guys name me some more fish. Name me some more fish. Let me some more fish. What kind of fish? Sharks, who else? Uh, trout. A trout would be there. Well, a trout wouldn't really be in an ocean, I don't think. But maybe. Anyway. Flounder. flounder. Ooh, that's a good name. I like flounder. Okay, those kind of things are all at the top. Starfish. All right? Those are all at the very top, which is called the euphotic layer, meaning the sun, when it shines down, is only at the very top. Then you get just a little sun and then no sun at all. Well, when Otis and Will were going down into the deep, let's leave the ocean over here, people didn't really know there was anything down there. A lot of people thought after there was no sunlight, there might be no life down there, and that it was just a bunch of dark water, right? So they were really trying to explore that. Now, one of their other challenges, now, how are they going to do that? If your challenge is that it's dark, what are you going to bring with you? Uh, we have one flashlight, and then what else, though? Do you want to do you want to have a light all the way down there? What's going to happen if you have a light? If you light up yourself all the way down, do you think the fish are going to come by you? Yes. No, no they're going to run away, right? So what do you need? You need like a spotlight inside the bathysphere that you can just turn on real quick and then turn off, so you can kind of surprise the fish or whatever the heck is down there, right? We don't know, <laughs> right? What's down there? Could be elephants, swimming elephants down there for all they knew. They really didn't know, okay? Now the next challenge or problem they had is pressure, okay? I need someone who looks strong. You look strong. Will you come up here for a minute? Come up here. All right. You guys, I always have to read this off the screen because I cannot remember this big number. The ocean is 1 quintillion 450 quadrillion tons of water, okay? That's a lot. We're going to pretend that this is the bathysphere. And what's your name? Milan. Milan. You're going to pretend that your hands are the ocean. Okay? You're going to put one hand underneath because the water's all over. You're going to put one hand on top. Okay, be the strong ocean. What's going to happen to the bathysphere? As you get heavier and heavier, what's going to happen? Come on, come on, come on, strong. Come on. Oh, oh. oh what happened if you're inside the bathysphere? Oh, thank you so much, honey. Actually, you guys can do this. If you have an electric pot or like a pressure cooker at home or you guys have one in your class, you can do this. I'm going to show you that this is really what happens. So there's our real cup. Ten minutes in a pressure cooker, and that's what the cup looks like. Ten more minutes, and that's what the cup looks like. Ten more minutes, and that's what the cup looks like until the cup basically starts melting away. So pressure, the pressure of the ocean is, is really, really pushing on the bathysphere, and it has to be engineered to keep that pressure of the water out, right? Or else our two explorers are going to be what? Yes. 
dead. <laughs> right? OK. And this goes to our last problem, air and fear. OK. There's two, we're going to, let's see. First, I'm going to show you how big the bath is, how, how small the bathroom is. I need three people to be in the bathosphere. Um, and if you've already come up here, put your hand out, because we're going to try to give as many people a chance. You come on up. Girl, the girl in the pink in the back, you come up. And um, you come on up. OK. All right. You three have a very complicated job. Seriously, this is the, this is the hardest part of the whole thing. You're going to t hold this rope. And you're going to kind of stretch your hands apart. OK, you're going to try to make this rope into a circle by moving around, away from each other. Move away from each other. There we go. OK, stop. That's about good. And you're going to, I know it's a square. There's no way to make a perfect circle with three people. Um, all right, but this, you guys, pull it away. That's how big the bathosphere was only. OK, that's, uh, well, don't, wait, don't stretch that much, kiddo. Um, I know, how are two people? And two people who are not just your height or my height, two people who are this height, OK? Now, wait, you guys just do that for a second. I'm going to let go of my half. I need two more people to help me. Um, I need you, and I need you. Come on up. OK, who is going to be who? You are going to be Otis Barton. <laughs> you are going to be Will Beebe. OK, you guys, when you write, Otis Barton and Will Beebe are my main what? Characters. They are my main characters, right. OK, we don't know why. <laughs> that is quite a mustache on you, I have to admit. <laughs> Otis Barton always, we're not sure why, he always wore this dorky looking hat. We don't know why. He called it his good luck hat, but he loved it. And so he, it, in every picture of the bathosphere, he's wearing a hat. And I picked you, even though you were wearing glasses, he never, he didn't really have it. You gotta be not shy, you gotta be up here and, and loose. Loosen up, Otis. Loosen up. Okay, and Will Beebe, you are a very well known naturalist. You know everything there is to know about animals. But still, you are human beings. So when I tell you that you are going to crawl into a little steel ball, come on, steel ball, come on over here. You guys crawl into the steel ball. Oh, and you kind of have to crouch down because, uh-oh, yeah, the steel ball is only about this tall, too. Right? It's a sphere. So it's not any bigger around than it is. Now, you need, what's going to happen to two people in a small space like that who are breathing and they're all sealed in? How, what's going to happen to the air? What's going to happen to their air? What? Both of those are true. Um, they are going to have a lack of air, so they brought oxygen with them, right? Yeah. But if you bring oxygen down, what are we breathing out? We breathe in oxygen. Dioxide. Good job. We're breathing out carbon dioxide, right? Which is also poisonous, right? So you have to have a way to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So Otis, you have another job. Otis, first of all, you put on this headset because you're going to be the guy who's talking to the people up above the ocean on the, on the boat and saying, oh no, this doesn't look good. Or, wow, cool fish. Depends. You don't know what you're going to say yet. You haven't gone down. Otis, you also have something called a palm fan. You guys, this was not high tech. They had a tray of chemicals. And Otis had to literally wait. Remember, while he's down in a, in a tiny space, breathing Will Beebe's breath, <laughs> going down into the ocean, trying to see fish out the window, he had, you're getting out of the bathosphere, get in. He had to remember to wave that fan over a tray of chemicals, or they would die. Because the carbon dioxide would build up. Now, Will, you have to sit there looking famous, because you were the more famous one, I believe. You have to take notes of everything while looking out the window, while you can't see, right? You don't really have a lot of light. 
So your notes are going to be a little hard to understand. And they are. When you read the real notes, they are a little hard to understand. Okay? So the problem that they had was air and fear. Because once they get in and we hand them all their stuff, the rest of us crew are going to bring over a 400-pound door going to come down on a winch because none of us can lift it. We're going to shove it up into the only opening of the bathysphere. We're going to crank them in with bolts and they can't get out themselves no matter what. Scary? Yeah. Scary. What a brilliant question. You guys go sit down and I'm going to, that's the very next question, you brilliant boy. All right, Otis and Will. You want to just stand here for a second or you want to go back? You want to sit here for a second? <laughs> go ahead, sit here for a second. Wait, ask your question again. Where's my brilliant boy? Ask it again. Okay, the <coughs> deepest questions. Remember, surface questions, deep questions? The deepest question. Why did they put their life on the line? Why? What do you think? What do you guys think? What do you think? Yeah, what do you think? Because they, they really wanted to see what was down there. Why do you think? Anybody else have another idea? What's your What's your idea, Ben? So, so is the, is the, uh, heavy? Super heavy. So can you go? Is it too much to go back up? Mmm. Yeah. Why would you put your life on the line? Why would you go down? You would only go down if you knew you could come back up. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that would be a smart and, thing. Um, then if, then you can't get out. If you go back to that surface, then you can't get out because they crank you? They have to crank you out. So you have to really trust. How much trust do you have to be having your crew? A you have to super time. trust your crew, right? Oh. You can't get out yourself. All right, anybody else know why they would go down? Why would they risk their lives? I love the way you put it. Say it again the way you put it. Why did they put their lives on the line? I love that. I'm going to remember that from now on. Why did they put their lives on the line? Why? To make history. To make history. All right. You guys, all of those things are true. You, I already know about third graders, and especially this group of third graders, that you are curious about a lot of stuff. When people are curious about something, when they really want to know about something, they will do anything to find out the answer. And Otis Barton and Will Beebe put their lives on the line, went down into the deepest part of the ocean, and I'm going to read you the book and we'll see what happens, okay? All right, Will and Otis, will you please go back? You can keep the mustache. Nobody wants to use the mustache. <laughs> you just leave this here. Yeah, you guys go back to where you were sitting, okay? Thanks, sweetie. Oh, I forgot, before we read the book, there's actually a little bit of film that was taken of the real guys going down. Okay, doesn't have any sound. Okay, I just want you to know it doesn't have any sound. Okay, but so just to set you up a little bit, that's the what? That's the bathysphere. I don't know if you can see, you can't see? When it starts moving, I think it'll be easier for you. This is just the leg of Otis Barton, and this is Will Beebe. Okay, so this is how they did it. This is a little bit about how they did it. There they are. Look at the dorky hat. There it is. But here's the big, this is the door that goes on. And that's how they're put in. Mm, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Pretty brave, huh? All right. We are going to read Otis and Will Discover the Deep. At least part of it. But there's a part that you guys are going to help me with. There's some words that repeat in the book. And they go down, down, into the deep. Can you guys say that with me? Down, down, into the deep. Okay. 
When you get to, when we get to that part, you guys are going to do the down, down into the deep part, okay? All right. Otis and Will discover the deep by me, Barb Rosenstock, and illustrated by Catherine Roy, who, if you don't know her, is a fabulous illustrator, and if you like sharks, the best shark book I ever saw called Neighborhood Sharks. Sorry, that was a little plug for Catherine. Okay, Otis and Will discover the deep. Otis Barton discovered the ocean early. He splashed in the Atlantic on summer vacations, sailed Vineyard Sound. He dove under the waves and watched the sand sharks scatter down, down, into the deep. What did the deep ocean look like? Otis wanted to be the first to find out. He tried breathing through a garden hose in his mouth sputtered to the surface. He put a wash tub over his head to trap air inside, but he kept popping up. He sketched a wood helmet with three glass windows that a carpenter made for a few dollars. Otis hung two sandbags around his neck and connected a hose. A friend pushed air into the helmet with a bike pump while Otis bounced on the shallow harbor bottom. Half an hour later, he surfaced and couldn't wait to go down again. Will Beebe discovered the ocean later. First, he hiked northern forests on summer vacations. He tracked woodland animals, studied snakes in his bedroom, and raised an orphan owl. Will grew up and trekked the world, collecting exotic birds for the Bronx Zoo. He climbed a smoking volcano, fought armies of stinging ants, and wrote best-selling books. Nothing surprised him until he dove into a shallow reef off the Galapagos Islands. A brand new world. Animals look like plants. Plants like animals. Rainbows of fish scattered down, down into the deep. What did the deep ocean look like? Will wanted to be the first to find out. Otis studied machines in college. He read an article on Will's plan to do a diving tank. Too long, too thin. If Will dove into the deep ocean in that contraption, the water's weight would crush him to death. No one had ever gone lower than a few hundred feet and come back. Otis sketched a new kind of diving tank, curved to spread out water pressure, small enough to sink, a hollow metal ball, just big enough for two explorers. Otis sent Will a letter. No answer. He wrote every week for two months. No answer. He begged a friend to set up a meeting with the famous explorer. Finally, Will agreed to see him. Otis unrolled his plans. Will took a hard look. They shook hands. As partners, they'd attempt to dive down, down, into the deep. Otis started building. Will started studying. They met in Bermuda to wait for their finished diving tank, the bathysphere. Inside the 5,000 pound bathysphere measured four and a half feet the size of a tiny closet. Otis and Will each stood about six feet tall. To get in, they wriggled like seals over the scratchy hatch bolts, fell to the cold steel bottom, and untangled their arms and legs. One sat with his knees up, while the other sat back on his heels. If Otis scooted left, Will had to scoot right. When Will reached up, Otis ducked down. Ropes lifted the 400-pound hatch into place. Their crew screwed down nuts and pounded in bolts to make the bathysphere watertight. Clang, bang, clang. Then total silence. Otis adjusted the telephone headset and checked the oxygen. Not enough, and they'd suffocate. Too much, and they'd be poisoned. Will wiped the window and took out his notebook. He checked his sight lines, 
up, down, and side to side, ready to write everything he saw. A winch turned, a cable tightened, pulleys spun, and the bathysphere rose high above the deck and twirled. Sky, sea, crew, sea. Cramped inside, Otis felt queasy. Will swore they'd crash through the hull. The crew swung the bathysphere over the water. Otis and Will splashed down, down, into the deep. Millions of bubbles frothed past the windows, then cleared. Seaweed, shells, sponges, all familiar. Otis and Will lost sight of the hull. Golden water deepened to green. 100 feet. The bathysphere jerked to a stop. Otis shuddered. Up above, the crew clamped the electric hose to the lowering cable so they didn't tangle. Every hundred feet. Breathe, Otis. Breathe, said Will. 200 feet. Stop. Otis fanned chemicals to clean the air and check temperatures. Will peered into the cool blue water and watched a blizzard of marine life rising past. 300 feet. Stop. We're leaking, Otis cried. Should we stop there? No. <laughs> do you want to go and do the rest? Yeah. Sasha, do we have time to do the rest? Yeah. Yes? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. We're leaking, Otis cried. A trickle seeped through the hatch door, wet the seat of Otis's pants, and collected at their feet. Will snapped on a flashlight. Would a tiny leak stop? Otis took a deep breath. He gave the crew Will's order to keep descending. 400 feet, stop, colder. Breathe in, 500 feet, stop, darker. Breathe out. 600 feet. Stop! Without warning, sparks showered down from the searchlight cord above Will's head. If they hit the oxygen tanks, the explorers would be cooked. Otis grabbed the cord, wiggled the searchlight. The sparking stopped. Breathe in. Breathe out. 700 feet. Stop! The dark ocean glowed. Their eyes played tricks in the mysterious inky gleam. Will tried to read. Print disappeared on the page. Otis examined color charts, saw only black and white. Creak, creak, creak. The hatch bolt struggled to hold back the frigid water, struggling to get inside. Will trembled. Breathe in, breathe out. 800 feet. Stop. Otis gave Will's order to hold at this depth. Shadowy shapes swam past the window. Mysterious lights were twinkling in the distance. They flipped on the bathysphere searchlight. Their eyes followed the pale yellow beam that scattered down, down, into the deep. What did the deep ocean look like? Is it empty? No. Otis and Will knew first. Half an hour later, they came up, up, into the light, and they were smiling. The end. Thank you guys so much for helping me. Now, I want to end with two special things. One is about five seconds, now maybe about 20 seconds of a movie 
of what the deep ocean really looks like if you haven't seen. So these are an example of some of the creatures that Otis and Bill might have seen out of the bathysphere. Are you ready? Look at that. They make their own light. It's called bioluminescence. That's a kind of shrimp, I believe. Doesn't look like what's on the surface, does it? It's clear. Mm -hmm. Look at this one. Isn't that super cool? That's a jellyfish that can make its own light and it makes it in colors. And then this is my favorite, which I think is a dragonfish up next. Here's a dra this one's a dragon, a kind of dragonfish. Is it coming? Come on, dragonfish, they're shy. There it is. All right, that's the dragonfish. Now, your second surprise, besides getting to see the deep ocean, is that we have a special guest here at the Library of Congress. It's a person who's my connection to history and your connection to the story of the bathysphere who came to see us today is Ms. Constance Carter. She's right here with us and she knew Will Beebe. So everyone give her a hand. And I've been with the library for 50 years. And I love answering questions from children as well as adults. I was William Beebe's uh, first uh, assistant in uh, the 1950s. I had just graduated from college and I had a chance to teach biology at Northfield School for Girls um, in, Northfield, in uh, Northfield, Massachusetts. And I went to my advisor and I said, isn't there something a dite interest, more interesting? Because I don't think I'd be a really good teacher. And she opened her bottom drawer and she pulled out a letter from William Beebe that said he uh, occasionally took recently graduated zoology majors with him on expeditions. Now, he was very famous, as we, we've seen. Um, and so he would get letters from very, very famous scientists and uh, whose books I had read in college. And so I would dance around the room and say, oh my goodness, my goodness, we've got a le letter from George Gaylord Simpson or Ernst Meyer. These were very famous scientists. And he would come over to the desk and he would toss those letters to the back of the desk and he'd say, no, today we're going to answer the letters of children. Because Ernest Meyer and George Gaylord Simpson are scientists in their own right. But what we need is to encourage children to ask questions. We want to give them some observations to make and some uh, experiments to do and to get them right, right to write back because nature is so wonderful and curiosity will lead them into make perhaps a life of science if we encourage them. And I've got a picture here of uh, children about your age coming to, uh, with their specimens to show uh, William Beebe, and he would take um, and, 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 and he would talk to them about what they had found. And he was very interested in whether it had been on a rock, or whether it had been, if they had found it near a stream, or if they had found it on a, on a leaf. Yeah. What's that? Uh, William Beebe isn't alive. But the boys and girls uh, that uh, he showed uh, the, the animals, some of them probably by now, since this was in the 1950s, the animals might be dead. 
<laughs> but the children and are I was you. very lucky to make zoological history uh, when California Zolifra uh, laid an egg on one of on, on my cheeks. See, they're supposed to lay their eggs on various species of passion guy. But one <laughs> came down and laid an egg. See how see how the egg what the egg looks like? It takes the eggs four days uh, to hatch, and then the, the, it, uh, it eats its eggshell, and then it starts eating little tendrils of passion vine. But the most fun was working with the author here, with Barb, because I found in the Library of Congress, we had uh, Matthew Broderick, uh, Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick. <laughs> we had Otis Barton's great, <laughs> great nephew. And what I liked about Barb is uh, William Beebe was pretty flamboyant. You know, he thought he was pretty good. But if it hadn't been uh, for Otis Barton, he would never have been able to go down into the sea because. He, he didn't have the engineering background that Otis had. He didn't have the money that Otis <laughs> had. And so Otis uh, was a great, great um, addition to the team. And uh, Will Beebe knew a lot about uh, animals. And, but people thought that Otis had not uh, waved his fa fan uh, 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 good enough because they thought that BB's descriptions of the animals uh, couldn't be possible. But I was up in Chautauqua in, uh, two years ago and in the New York Times it said, we all thought William BB was, uh, had lost oxygen. But now we know that more than 75% of all the creatures that live below the sea are bioluminescent. And we have Michelle Kroll over here, and she has the, uh, the papers of uh, Gloria Hollister, who was on the mothership, you know, we saw the big crane come over, and she was the one who was saying to Otis, you're 400 feet you're down, you're 500 feet down, and he would say, and then she would say, BB, what are you seeing? So um, the Library of Congress has a lot of material on William BB, and that was why we were able to help Barb um, write her story. And that's why we're able to help children like you and teachers. And see those four? Um, notebooks over there. Those have uh, guides to uh, science fair projects on uh, natural history, on space, on um, the environment. And I've also given uh, your, your teachers um, some uh, everyday mysteries uh, that the library puts out. And so that uh, I've got copies for you. I've got uh, uh, little uh, bookmarks that will tell you um, how uh, to connect with the Library of Congress. And we encourage uh, children and especially teachers. We have a whole uh, staff that just works with teachers um, so to help you answer your questions. But B.B. loved children and he loved answering, que answering questions because if you don't ask questions, if you're not curious, you uh, don't find out about life and, and it really helps you to grow up uh, to really appreciate uh, nature and science and you might find some really interesting things to do, some great occupations. Now, I bet you have some more questions for Barb. Wait a minute. Do you have a, before she sits down, do you have any questions for um, Ms. Carter? Does anybody have any questions for her? Yeah. Oh. I went to Smith College. Oh, okay. thank you. Oh, there you go. Yeah. This on. And uh, Amundsen, who works uh, giving books to uh, boys and girls, has just given me Swimming with the Sharks. 
and in it, she points out this is by Eugenie, uh, this is the discoveries of Eugenie Clark, and in it, she says she was inspired by William Beattie. Yes, she was, yeah. And there is a picture that she has right here on the wall. Here she is, and here she has a picture of the bathysphere on her wall to keep her on target, to know that you have a lot of problems when you're trying to do something uh, great. And so she was inspired by William Beebe, and we hope that you will be inspired by this book as well. But I was very lucky to major in zoology, so that helped me help Barb. You have one more, at least one more question yeah. there, I think. For you, the question for Connie, yeah. for Mrs. Carter. Was yeah. you thinking about uh, going when, when William Beebe uh, didn't have nobody, uh, he was still begging for people to go in the bathosphere with him. Was you thinking about going with him? Did you ever think about going in the bathosphere? Well, let me tell you, I have claustrophobia. <laughs> and I have claustrophobia. And I would have been hard pressed to be <laughs> in there. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I think it was before Dramamine, so <laughs> I think Otis Barton <laughs> was pretty, uh, you know, he held on to his cookies pretty well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me let me take the uh, yellow shirt, and then I'm coming to green. Um. Why would they bring a tray of chemicals with them? Because at that time, that was what would gather up the uh, carbon dioxide. And so they had to have three or four chemicals, and they had to distribute them throughout the little bathysphere. So that's why he had the, the fan. I'll yeah. answer that oh, question. Yeah. Well, I don't need this. Actually, you, no, you no, can no. just do No, it. yes, yeah, no, it, it, well, it yeah. was true. Yeah, it's yeah, completely she, true. Right. She, she did all her research. <laughs> she read books. She read articles. Uh, she looked at film. And the moving image, if you ever go to New York, the uh, Museum of the Mo Moving Image has a lot of William Beebe and Otis Barton film as they were testing the bathysphere. Okay, what did, how, yeah, what did, and how can it delight in water stops electronics? Okay, those are two great questions. Uh, do you want to be an engineer when you grow up? Because those are the two biggest engineering questions of the whole thing. First of all, they didn't really want to make it light because you wanted it to do what? Sink, right? So it was okay if it was heavy, but it had to be not so heavy that when you pulled it up on a boat, think about it, well, the whole boat could have tipped over, right, if it was too heavy? So you had to be careful about things like balance, but it, so two men in it, plus the bathysphere was 5,000 pounds. They wanted it to sink. It didn't have a motor or anything. It just was lowered slowly by some pulleys and ropes uh, and a winch, which is a thing that pulls something up, I guess, for simpler. Okay, Miss Science, tell me what a winch is, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I am not, I'm a word person. It, She's it, a science it person. It pulls up and lowers. lowers something. And they had to be very careful that the, uh, the, the, the uh, lines did not get tangled. Right. So, uh, and you're right, electricity was, and water do not mix, right? Should you ever put, uh, like, your, your hair dryer in the bathtub? No. No, that's dangerous. <laughs> Don't do anything. No electricity <laughs> around water. So the, the cables, they had to be special cables. They were wrapped special so that they were watertight. But there was no wireless communication there. So if you think about it, every time he was talking on it, it was actually plugged into a wire, and the communication went up to Gloria at the top um, at, on the boat. And there were actually two boats. There was sort of like a barge-like boat, which was where the bathysphere actually was. And then there was a tugboat that was pushing that barge back and forth. There were like two boats. There was a lot of crew members, lots. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, here. What was your favorite part of helping them? Oh, my favorite part of helping William Beebe and um, being in Trinidad was I raised butterflies and fiddler crabs. And um, all my, um, uh, my butterflies ate 
ver uh, various sp species of uh, passion vine. And one day I was in the butterfly house, and we had big butterfly houses made of uh, aluminum, like screening. And one day I was had a long bamboo stick with some lantana that I had dipped in honey and sugar water. And I was like this, trying to uh, get one of the butterflies to get on the, the lantana so that he wouldn't be stuck up on the roof of the, uh, the butterfly house. And an a, a, a butterfly came and laid an egg on my cheek. And I rushed into the laboratory and I said, Dr. Beebe, Dr. Beebe, I've made zoological history. Heliconius has laid an egg on my cheek. And he pulled himself up to a six foot th uh, two and said, hmm, must have mistaken you for a passion flower. And I said, oh no, a clinging vine. But it took, as I told you, four days for the uh, egg to hatch and I kept putting my finger up to my face to make sure it was all right. Well, we in the laboratory, we had boards that had little cracks, and the, uh, the egg fell into one of the cracks, and we weren't certain. And so we would have had to stuff uh, pounds and pounds of passion vine and leaves, passion leaves uh, of the vine down into the cracks in order for the uh, caterpillar to live uh, when it came out of its egg four days later. And <laughs> so that one was lost. <laughs> okay, you guys, we're going to, um, we're going to, you guys can ask me questions about the book or about my other books, or you're welcome to ask Ms. Carter questions. So you can ask both of us. Is that okay? And what we're going to do is I'm going to take, just to make it a little fair, we're going to take a question from sort of this side of the class and then a question from this side of the class, and we're going to go back and forth until someone tells me that they can stop, oh, that you guys have to stop, okay? So, well, you can give me one of those because that might help too. Thank you. Okay, ask your question. Do you have any graphic novel books? Do I have, okay, the question was, do I have any graphic novel books? And the answer is, no, I like graphic novels. They are great things to read. But I love picture books because I love telling a short story that moves along really quickly. And I also love working with the illustrators. I mean, but we've got a graphic novelist right over there. Oh, yeah, he's a graphic. He writes graphic <laughs> novel books. You can talk to him later. Yeah. You can talk to him later. <laughs> Oh my goodness, yes. Library of Congress people, do you have a lot of graphic novel books? Oh, she's showing you. There you go. So the answer is. There you go. The Library of Congress has 120,000 comic books. How long do you think it would take you to read 120,000 comics? Two years. Two years. Okay. Okay, yeah, what's your question? You guys, can you hang on a second? Because I really want to hear, I really want to hear everybody's questions. Okay. How many books did you um, write? I wrote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, nine are here. I think there's six more that aren't here. And I have something like six coming out in the next three years. So. How many did I write in total? You know, you're asking me to add. <laughs> And um, nine, okay, I think about 20. I'm going to guess 20. It's either 19 or 20. I don't add really well. I think she's very industrious. Nine, 19 or 20. Yeah, oh, but I wanted to tell you this. Every book I wrote, just because I had it published, that doesn't mean that every book I wrote has been published. I have, when you guys write, do you ever practice? Just practice, right? And it doesn't really, maybe it doesn't turn out what you thought or whatever. Then you just put it aside. Right? Well, so do authors have those kinds. So I have at least probably between five and ten books that I wrote all the way through, but something's wrong with them. And I'm just not ready to send them out to a book company. Or book companies still sometimes say, yeah, no, I don't, just don't think that that's a great story right now. So I have books for practice, too. So I guess probably altogether I've probably written about thir between 30 and 40 books, pretty much. Okay, who had a question over here? Yes. What's your favorite book that you're still working on? I am working on a book right now that I cannot tell you much about, but it is about monarch butterflies. Oh. 
but I can't tell you very much about it. But it will come out when you're, you guys are in third grade. Probably by the time you're in sixth grade, it will come out. Um, yes, ma'am, in the back. Did I write about comics? Yeah. Have I written about comics? No, but that's a really good idea, graphic novel person over there. <laughs> no, but that's a phenomenal idea. Did you ever write anything about comics? Honey? She's done. Did you ever write anything about comics? Did you ever write comics? Yes. Yes? OK, good. Someday, you, did, do your teachers know? Have they seen it? Yes? Okay, good. Keep doing it. That's great. Yes? Um, when, when did you start, when did you start being Honey, you know what? We're going to have to ask you to do it one more time. Ask the question one more time. When did you start being, being a writer? I started being a writer way after I was a grown-up. First, I worked in marketing and advertising for a long time. And then I have two sons that are now grown, but when they were about your age, I used to read to them a lot of picture books, and they liked true stories, like about pirates and football players and stuff like that. And when I would read some of them, they were a little boring. Some of them were like, George Washington was born in 1745, or whatever year George Washington was born in, because I don't know, and I'm not sure I care, right? Because 1745 doesn't mean a lot to us. So I thought to myself, wait a minute. I bet I could, maybe I could write books that are about history, about true things, but make them more like the family stories that I heard my grandpa tell. And that's kind of how I started being a writer. So I was almost a little bit over 40 years old before I became a writer. Wow, that is old. You watched black and white TV. Whoa. Yes, sir. I have made, I have made my own graphic. You have? What's the, what's the title? F and F. F and F, and what does that stand for? It's a scary book. Oh. All right, it's a scary book? Like a horror story kind of book? Oh, no, I'm one of those people that even when the horror story commercials come on TV, I have to go running out of the room. I'm serious. I am so bad. I am a chicken. Like, you could put wings on me, and I will cluck. Do not tell me your serious scary story, but anybody who likes scary stories, I hope that they read your book. Yes, sir. Who inspired you to do books? Who inspired me to do books? My sons. Okay, you guys, here's how it's going to go. We have one time for one last question. If you get chosen for that last question, that's great. If you, st if you still have other questions, I have a website. The Library of Congress has a website. Your parents can go on it. Your teachers can go on it. If nobody can find the answer to your question, your teachers, your parents, anybody, have one of your teachers email me, and because I saw you here at the Library of Congress, I will answer your question back, okay? If it's a question that you can't find the answer to after doing research. All right, so this is going to be the very last question, and it is going to you. How old are you? Ah! <laughs> I, will, I used to make children guess, but that turned out to be very dangerous. So I am 58 years old. I was born in 1960, and no, the Civil War did not happen then, okay? What, wait, what year were you guys? What year were you born? I'm curious. May, sir. No, what year, hon? Oh, 2009. Oh, my goodness, 2009. You guys have your whole lives ahead of you to read, to write. To come to the Library of Congress and see lots of interesting things. And to, if you get a chance, save the ocean. Okay? And if you ever get a chance to pick up things in the beach, pick up garbage in the beach, stop someone from hurting fish or planets, or planets, plants or animals on the beach. Our oceans are almost 90% not explored. We don't want to lose them. So if you can please grow up, if anybody feels like growing up and being a marine biologist or anything, the oceans really need you. All right, thank you guys so much for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.